other own terms. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it's a little late, so we should uh, get started. Let's, uh, as we always do, uh, prepare our hearts with a uh, time of silence. Stand with me. We want to begin our worship this morning in number 115, 115 unto him who hath loved us. Number 115. Oh, the 
setting sun. Let us talk of all its wondrous love and care. And when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll safety there and back, and for whoever's given the word, I guess probably Tom, given the word, so pray for Tom. And, uh, and next Sunday will be uh, February 6th, everything starts uh, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, will be the first Sunday uh, of the month. And we need to pray for our government, both federal, state, local. Uh, that they might seek the Lord, or the, the Lord would bring somebody in their pathway that could give them a good word. Pray for the those that are being persecuted, especially in Afghanistan at this time, and the sick. There are many. Uh, the main ones we've uh, discussed, we haven't heard about Mike Johnson. Any news on Mike? So continue to pray for those that are recovering and those that are taking treatment. 
our college students, the uh, broadcasts, both Sokrobs to the Middle East and here, and Tom's also, Real Life Ministries, Whitefields National Pastors, and for CEF, uh, a new request. Uh, we've been uh, inquiring about the uh, fair uh, coming up for this summer, and they're not giving us much time to prepare, and we don't even know if people will come because of COVID. But they, the fair board has decided to have fair uh, this summer. So pray, pray the Lord would give us direction at CEF. It's a lot of work, and it's a uh, very short order. They want... Uh, uh, your money and your your insurance and all that stuff, all the paperwork done the 1st of March. That doesn't give us much time. So just pray the Lord would direct uh, the CEF chapter here about that. Okay, uh, any other announcements? Yes, Scott. Oh, yeah, Dr. Lisa Hickman, she used to come here. She's in uh, Ohio now. And uh, she said she has frozen water pipes, so no water. So pray for her. It says 20 below zero. With it. And uh, <clears throat> she said to say hello, and that she loves and misses everybody. And also, it's in the insert in the bulletin about the Dickinsons getting COVID. Yeah, they all have COVID. Yeah, I think, I think in one place it said except for Dehora, but I don't know if that's changed since <laughs> what I saw there. I think oh, they're did? planning on, uh, on coming to the States this this term also. Yes. So do pray for them. Uh, okay, any others? All right, thank you very much. Next. All right. If you would uh, stand with me and uh, turn to number 616. Fight the good fight. 616. <laughs> no matter what situation we're in. Uh, we, Lord, we pray for our government that's in great need. Lord, we pray for salvation, repentance, and seeking your wisdom. Lord, not just for our federal government, but state and local and world leaders as well. Lord, we pray for a revival. Lord, we pray also for persecuted brethren around the world. Lord, many that are suffering for their faith in you and some that have even given their lives. We pray continue to be with those, Lord, that they may be faithful and true to the end and be 
uh, witnesses to those holding them captive, Lord, that uh, many would turn to you. We pray, Lord, for our sick, for Ed and Judy and Margie, and Myrna, Sam and Betsy, Mitra, Stella, Jolie, Stella, Clint, the whole Cable family, Lord, with COVID, Lori, and Sue's mom, Lord, for Jeanette and Judy and Rebecca and Marcia and Mike Johnson, Lord, for also for Cody with his dehydration, Lord, that he might be able to get that worked out. Uh, Lord, for the Dickinsons, as they get over COVID, that you would just continue to use them. We pray you'd be with Lisa Hickman, that her water pipes would thaw out and that she would have running water again. Lord, undertake for the CEF booth and that all the fees and everything that have to be uh, paid by March and that you would just bring in out of your storehouse, Lord, all that's needed and uh, volunteers to help get everything done. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for our college students. Help them, Lord, to, to be true to the faith, that they would not be uh, listening to false teachings and, and giving in to that, Lord, but that they would remain firm in their faith. Uh, we pray for unsaved loved ones, Lord, that you would bring someone across their path to share with them the words of life, that they might have a godly sorrow that works repentance and salvation. Also continue to bless the broadcasts that are going forth through Tom and Sir Rob and the uh, CEF Good News Clubs. We pray, Lord, for teachers, volunteers to teach those classes and continue to bless the Mobile Dental Van and the Whitefields National Pastors, Lord. And also for the upcoming trip, Lord, to Loretto, we pray that you would uh, guide and direct and all that, work everything out, and that it would be a great time of focusing on you and your goodness. Now, lead us on as we continue to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. We're going to have a special music. All right.
such a beautiful song. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, how many remember that from the 70s, 80s, you know, that, that song? Is, 60s, yeah, well, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful song, and, uh, you know, just the, 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 the phrase, it keeps repeating it, Jesus left heaven to die in my place. What mercy, what love, and what grace. That's, um, uh, thank you so much, you know, to, uh, we feel like we've had a little resurrection here of an old song, so that's wonderful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that Jesus left heaven to die in our place. And uh, Lord, we, we, we're just amazed. We stand amazed, Lord, in the, in the mercy and the love and the grace that, uh, that Jesus showed. Lord, now open our hearts, open our minds as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you turn, please, in your Bible to the last chapter in Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3. Not a very long book, three chapters, <clears throat> Habakkuk chapter 3, but it's, um, it's a remarkable book uh, because Habakkuk is a, uh, a remarkable person and um, <clears throat> we don't know very much about him as a person, but we know a lot about what God's heart was through him as he was such a faithful prophet. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. This is a prayer. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigionah. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember in mercy. God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in trouble. And the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was his thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon horses and thy chariots of salvation. Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the old paths of the tribes, even thy words, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Thou, the, the, the mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation of thine anointed. <coughs> Thou woundest the head of all the out of the house of the wicked, thou, by discovering the foundation unto the next, Zelo. Thou didst strike through with thy, his staves, the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of the deep waters. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones. And I trembled in myself that I might not rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no fruit. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He'll make my feet like hinds feet. He'll make me to walk upon high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. So as I mentioned here, this is the last chapter in a very interesting book, the book of Habakkuk here. And as Habakkuk is coming now to his, this, this final chapter, you really get the feeling that he's brought it all together. 
he, 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 he has, there's a constant, there's a feeling of consummation here. There's a, there's a feeling that Habakkuk can say, I did my job. Just like Paul said when he said, I ran the course. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6, 7 Timothy 4, 6, 4, 6. Paul said, I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. It's a wonderful thing in life what Paul did. Because he's got an eye on the three times. He's got an eye on the future, he's got an eye on the present, and he's got an eye on the past. And what Paul is saying there is that from my present right now, I'm ready. I'm ready to depart. The time of my departure is at hand. I am now ready to be offered. And then he looks back over the past over his life, and he says, I did it. I did what I was supposed to do. I have fought a good faith. I have finished the, my course. I have kept the faith. What he goes on to say in that passage is now looking at the future. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me. So he's got an, it's a wonderful thing in life to be able to look at the present and to say, I'm ready to be offered. And to be able to look at the past and say, I did the will of God. And be able to look to the future and say, all I see is wonderful things happening. Wonderful things happening. What a life. This is what the prophet Habakkuk did. He's finished his course that God called him to. And he ends this life he ends this chapter like he's ending his life with a prayer. This chapter is a prayer. It's a personal prayer. All prayer is personal. It's a personal prayer. It's a personal communication between one man, Habakkuk, and his God. And our privilege this morning is to be able to see his prayer, to see what he said from his heart as Habakkuk prayed to God. We don't know what God said in reply. That's not here. There are no words from God in this chapter. And the first words of this chapter set it out when he says, he says he wants us to know that he is praying this prayer and he's praying it as a prophet, as a prophet. Verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. He's telling us, he's showing us here, he's, he's illustrating for us what a prophet does, a prophet prays. A prophet prays. That's just not how we're normally used to thinking about prophets. Prophets, we're usually used to thinking about prophets. Well, they preach. They declare. They say, thus saith the Lord. That's a prophet. The priests, the priests pray. That's what they do. We think of prophets, they represent God to the people, and therefore we expect them to say, thus saith the Lord. A priest, on the other hand, represents the opposite direction, people to God. Therefore, we expect to see priests pray. But here, Habakkuk, the prophet, is praying. And it shows us, when we kind of look at, at the life of, of Habakkuk and all the prophets, we can see that their lives can be described by four words. Four words which describe the life, the goal, the work of a prophet. First, the prophet sees. He has things revealed to him. Amos 3.7, Amos 3.7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The prophets have things revealed to them. They have their eyes open. That's why the prophets, you oftentimes read about, I saw Isaiah. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Ezekiel, he saw these great images. All the prophets see things that others don't see. So the first role, primary role of a prophet is to see. To see what God opens their eyes to be, to see. The second role of a prophet is not to be quiet about it. The second role of a prophet is to warn. Now, a word that, 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 that expresses warning that's used throughout the prophets is the word woe, woe. That's a word that's used most in the Bible by the prophets, especially the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. 
Isaiah 3.11, for example, Isaiah 3.11, Isaiah says, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. That's the second role of a prophet, warn. And oftentimes they use that word woe in order to warn. The third role of the prophet was not just to be a prophet of doom, but the third role was the word that's described as guide. Guide. Prophets were not just prophets of doom, but the prophet was therefore guiding the people to safety. As we see the prophet Isaiah doing in telling the people to follow God when he said in Isaiah 58, 11, very typical of a prophet, Isaiah 15, 11, the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. That's why the book of Isaiah and the other books of the prophets are so encouraging because they show the wrong way, but they also show the right way and what comes. But prophets not only see, they not only warn, they not only guide, but they also do what this prophet's doing, they pray. Then that shows the prophet was not an insensitive rock to just see and warn and, 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 and guide because when the prophet saw, he warned. And when the prophet warned, he guided. And when the prophet guided, he prayed. He prayed. And those are the four words, therefore, that describe the work of the prophet. Those same four words are what God wants to see in our lives. He wants us to see. To see. He, Jesus said, Jesus said on the, on the subject of us seeing, he said in, in John 16, 12, John 16, 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. He is itching to show us more. He just, but he's saying, you're just not ready yet, but I want you to be. So the Lord wants to show us. And like the prophet, when we see, God wants us to warn. He told Ezekiel in Ezekiel 33.7, Ezekiel 33.7, he told the prophet Ezekiel, See thou... O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Wherefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. And we are to warn. There's something to be warned about. Just as sure as there's a heaven, there's a hell. And just as sure as there's a heaven that, should, that people should be guided into, there's a hell that people should be warned about. And when we warn, God wants us to guide at the same time. As he said in Mark 16, 15, Mark 16, 15, this is the, really the gospel command is a, uh, uh, is a command to guide. When he said in Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So as prophets, we guide the lost to Jesus Christ. We guide the lost to Jesus Christ. When, <clears throat> when God spoke to the prophet Paul, we oftentimes call him the Apostle Paul, he's a prophet. When God spoke to the prophet Paul, he said about his life and the commission that he gave him in his life in Acts 23, 26, 17. Acts 26, 17. He told Paul that he had delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I, now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. See, he told Paul, he says, Paul, I delivered you for a purpose. I delivered you so that I could send you. And I send you to open the eyes that are closed with sin. To turn the souls that are trapped by darkness into a realm of light. To turn the souls from being under the power of Satan to God. So that all of this to enable lost souls 
to receive forgiveness and inheritance. To, and all of this, Paul, is found in me, in Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm sending you to turn the lost to Jesus Christ. So that after we've seen, after we've warned, after we've guided, then God wants us, like a prophet, to pray. To pray. He said in 1 Timothy 2.1, 1 Timothy 2.1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All men. He said, all men. That means our lost friends. When they, when something good happens to our lost friends, we have a responsibility to give thanks to God for that. When, when we see our lost friends going in the wrong way, we have a responsibility to intercede for them, to talk to God, to pray to God, to beg God, supplications for them. That's why he says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks, be made for all men. God only knows how much the world really depends on our prayers. We don't know. Just as in the life of, there was a man named Abimelech, and, and he, was, he was so dependent on the prayers of Abraham that his life depended on it. His life depended on the prayers of another man, Abraham, when he said, in, in, when, 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 when God came to Abimelech at night and told him that in Genesis 20, verse 3, Genesis 20, verse 3, God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she's a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, this is Sarah, and he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she's my sister, and she even herself said, she's my, he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore, restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that is thine. God represented Abraham as a prophet. Who ever thought of Abraham as a prophet? That's what God said in verse 7, in Genesis 20, verse 7. Genesis 20, verse 7. He's a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. And so Habakkuk now goes on in his prayer, and he prays to God in verse 2. He says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. When the, the Hebrew word for, 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 for speech, for speech, when he says, I have heard thy speech, is the word Shema. It's the word Shema. It's the word Shema. Shema means to hear. Shema can also mean to call. So in other words, Habakkuk is saying, I heard your call. I heard your call. This is what happens to a person when they're saved. They hear the call of God. They stop hearing our calls, and they hear the call of God. And that's what happens to a person when they obey God. They hear the call of God. Like the hymn says, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. We had a missionary one time, I believe it was to Indonesia, and to the natives of Indonesia, and that missionary had a practice that, that in the evenings he would gather those illiterate uh, who couldn't, natives who couldn't read together at night, and he would read to them from the Bible. And I remember the missionary wrote us a letter and said that, that the, the natives gave a, a title to the meetings that they would have at night, and they said that we gave that title, the, the natives gave the title, we're going to the God Talk meeting, the God Talk meeting. Because they, 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 they understood that when the Bible was read to them, God was talking to them. And the only reason that Habakkuk heard God because because he said, I heard you talk, I heard you call, I heard your Shema in verse 2. And because of that, because and, 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 and that's, that's why he moved on. And why did he hear? How did he hear God talk? How did he hear God's call? He heard it because in the chapter before, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, in the first verse 
of the second chapter, Habakkuk said he did something. And what he did is he said, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. Habakkuk heard God because Habakkuk had set himself to be on a watch to hear God. Habakkuk had set himself like a guard on a, on a, on a tower of a city to hear what God was going to say to him. And that's the only way that you and I are going to hear God talk to us. And we're going to be able to say, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech. I have heard thy speech. It's because we have first said in our hearts, verse the, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch, and I'll set me upon the tower, and I'll watch to see what he will say unto me. In other words, in other words, it's the same thing as what Moses told Israel in Deuteronomy 4.29. Deuteronomy 4.29. Seek the Lord thy God, if thou shalt find them. If, thou, if you seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And then the next verses, Habakkuk then speaks of the, the greatness of God. All of this chapter is speaking about the greatness of God. And Habakkuk lands in particular he's going through he's referring to different times in the history of Israel and he lands on this time when Joshua was fighting was fighting the battle with the Amorites <coughs> and in the middle of that battle Joshua was so excited about how God was giving the victory and he was realizing that if the sun goes down and if there's a moon then the enemy's going to escape so Joshua, in his boldness, he sits there and he commands, Sun and moon, stand still. And that's what he's referring to in verse 11. Verse 11, the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering sword. That was all happened in Joshua 10, verse 12. Joshua 10, verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites, before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day, and there was no day like that before it ever or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. This was all to prevent the enemy from, from having the benefit of night to escape. And God did it. Now Habakkuk really reaches high when he says about God in, 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 in verse 13, verse 13, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation of thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked. The prophet is now, again, he's drawing from the history of Israel. He's drawing from the history we have in the Bible. And as he draws from it, the history of how God came from heaven to deliver Israel out of Egypt. This should always be on our minds. I love the festival, the, the, I love the holiday of Passover. I love the holiday of Passover. Not so that I can eat the filth of fish and all these other kind of things. No, just to remember how God came from heaven to deliver Israel. That's what happened. And this is what the prophet is doing. He's encouraging himself in God. He's looking back over the history of God's kindness. And that's why it's so important for us to live in this book, in the histories, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament. I wish we'd stop calling it old. It's just as new as it ever could be. In the Bible... And when times are hard, and when it looks like it's so dismal in God's people, we have a secret source of encouragement to remember the encouraging histories in the Bible. David, David had so many problems in his life. He had so many problems, but he had a secret that kept him from depression. He had a depression sometimes that it just made him so he couldn't speak. And he forced himself to remember what God did in the past to get out of it. In Psalm 77, 4, Psalm 77, 4, when David said, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. That's the secret. 
The secret for him was looking back over the history. It's a powerful argument in prayer to God. To say something like Isaiah said in Isaiah 63, 11. Isaiah 63, 11, when he said, Then remembered he the days of old, Moses and his people. And he said, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led him by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name? that led them to the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down to the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is the zeal and the strength, the sounding of thy bowels, thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless, thou art our Father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer, Thy name is from everlasting. You know, there's a particular people that are praying that prayer in Isaiah. It's a particular people. It's a people that describe themselves in Isaiah 63, 16. Isaiah 63, 16. They say about themselves, Israel Acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our Father and Redeemer. When they say, Israel acknowledge us not, they are a people that Israel is saying, you're not Jew. You're no longer Jew. You're no longer Jew. Just like when I as a Jew applied for Israeli citizenship and they asked me if I believe that Jesus Christ is God. And when they knew what I believed, they said, you cannot become an Israeli because you are no longer a Jew. Isaiah 63, 16. Though Israel acknowledge us not. This is the remnant. These are the Jews that have believed into Jesus and therefore they call him, in Isaiah 63, 11, Isaiah 63, 11, they call him our Redeemer. These are our Jewish brothers in Christ who are facing great problems, and they call out to God in Isaiah 63, 11, and they say, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within them? These are the, this is the, the per persecuted Jewish remnant that says in Isaiah 63, 15, Isaiah 63, 15, look down from heaven, and behold the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and the strength, the sounding of thy bowels and thy mercies toward me? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou art, O Lord, our God, our Redeemer. Habakkuk used a wonderful name for God when he said in verse 13, verse 13, Thou wentest forth, for the salvation of thy people. That's what she just sang. Jesus left heaven for me to die in my place. And that's what Habakkuk is saying in verse 13. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. That was the time when God went forth. That was the greatest time in verse 13. When God went his forth for the salvation of thy people. That's when Jesus came and said... In John 6.38, John 6.38, I came down from heaven. In John 6.51, John 6.51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. That's when Jesus said in John 3.13, John 3.13, He that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man lift, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth into him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth into him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I said, into him, because that's the way the Greek reads. Jesus came from heaven. He came down to earth. He's the person that Habakkuk is referring to in verse 13. Verse 13, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. 
And this is what the this is what the prophet Habakkuk is doing. He's focusing on a time of great depression, a time of great darkness. He's focusing on history of how God dealt with Israel. So so amazing to me when whenever I read the last words of of uh, Stephen of Stephen in Acts seven when he was allowed to give his last words before he was stoned to death. I don't know of a more beautiful summary of history than, his, than, than he gave in Acts 7, and just before he was martyred. So beautiful. And why did he do that? How could he do that? How could Stephen put together, in, in a, without any preparation, no one said to him that day, you're going to be killed today, so you better sit down at your desk and prepare your last words. No, he was, just, he was caught right on the heels. And he does this wonderful, beautiful going through the history of how God brought Israel uh, into Egypt as a tiny little family exiled by the forces of famine to be aliens in a strange land of Egypt. And just like we are exiled by the forces of sin to live our lives as, as aliens in a strange, strange place called the world. And how God within that foreign land of Egypt nourished this little family this little family of Jacob to grow into a, a people, a large people called Israel. Just like we are, are within the foreign world, God nourishes us to grow in Christ. And how that foreign land of Egypt then turned against Israel in a hatred and persecuted them, wanting to destroy them. Just like we experience the hatred of the world against us and, and how God did not allow Egypt to crush them, did not allow Egypt to destroy them. But, rest, but came down to rescue them. And when he came to Moses, that's what he told him in Exodus 3.7. Exodus 3.7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up of uh, that land, into a good land, and a large land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Just like God came down to rescue us. And how when, Mo when, when, when Moses saw God on Mount Sinai, that's what he saw on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19.20, Exodus 19.20, the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Those are wonderful words. Wonderful words about God. Exodus 3 8, Exodus 3 8. I am come down to deliver. Wonderful words. Wonderful words. God came down to deliver. Wonderful words to describe Jesus. John 6 38. I came down from heaven. That makes Jesus to have the name of the Savior who came down to deliver. The statement in, in verse 13 here, verse 13, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. That's a statement that's saying the priority for God is to save his people. It's so great that he will disrupt, he will shake all the powers of nature like the parting of a red sea, a great sea. He'll stop the course of nature. He'll stop the course of the sun and the moon for the salvation of his people. He'll throw, God will throw all of nature into disorder to save his people. All because there's a people on earth that are so important to God that he'll do all that for them. Those are God's saved people. And now Habakkuk paints for us what happened when God parted the Red Sea for Israel. When, the, when Israel was running for their lives away from the Egyptians. In Habakkuk 3.15, Habakkuk 3.15, verse 15, verse 15, he says, Thou didst walk through the sea, with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. This is a time when the Red Sea stood as the great obstacle to Israel. They were piled up against it like a firing squad, and Egypt was fast on their heels. And this was a time when the mighty Red Sea said to Israel, huddled up against its shore, what a pathetic sight. And, and the great Red Sea said to Israel, no, you won't. You won't pass any further. I am the great, the great Red Sea. I am bigger and stronger than you, and I'll hold you back from crossing my waters. I'll hold you back as the Egyptians plunge their swords into you. That was the obstacle that they were faced with, the Red Sea. 
And God saw that Red Sea, and God just pushed the sea open. He pushed it open. God pushed that Red Sea away, and so that on both sides stood up great walls of water, as if God said, as if God said to the Red Sea, you pile up on this side, you pile up on that side, and you stay there until I tell you. And those walls stood there as, as Israel walked through on dry land. And he says in verse 15, verse 15, Thou didst walk through the sea. They've been running before, but not now. They walk. They walk. They don't run. Because God didn't run through the sea. Because Israel could only walk. Israel was tender. Israel had little ones. Israel had cattle. That's what Jacob told Esau. Jacob told Esau in Genesis 33. Genesis 33. Esau said, let's go. Let's go home. And, 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 and Jacob said in Genesis 33, 13. Genesis 33, 13. He said unto him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender. The flocks and the herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Then my Lord, I pray thee, pass over for us. And I will leave on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able. Isaiah 63, 16. Isaiah 63, 16. He led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. The parting of the Red Sea was one of the great miracles that God did for Israel. It involved water. It involved water. This first miracle involving water was the parting of the Red Sea. We know it so well, uh, Exodus 14, Exodus 14, Moses stretched out, 1421, 1421, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, made the sea dry land, the waters were divided, the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry land, not even mud, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. The second great miracle that that, that the, uh, involving water was the parting of the river Jordan. The parting of the river Jordan under Joshua. Joshua 3.15. Joshua 3.15. As they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth his banks all the time of the harvest, that the water which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam, that is Zaretan, and those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed right against Jericho. The priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the River Jordan. And all the Israel, Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were clean passed over. That's what God did for them. He disrupted the course of nature for their salvation. The third miracle, the third miracle was, was when water came out of a rock, a solid rock of flint. Exodus 17, 6. Exodus 17, 6. The people were thirsty in the desert. They needed water. And Exodus 17, 6 says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and they never forgot it. They never forgot it, and Moses made sure they never forgot it. He said to them in Deuteronomy 8.15, Deuteronomy 8.15, as Moses is getting ready to die, and he's giving his last final words, as if he's putting great treasure in their pockets, he said, put this in your pocket. Deuteronomy 8.15, God led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents, scorpions, drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. And looking back over these three miracles involving water, David said, David said in Psalm 114, 1, 1, Psalm 114, 1, When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language, Judah was his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams and little hills like lambs. What ail thee, O thou sea? that thou fleddest, thou Jordan, that thou was driven back, ye mountains that you skipped like ram, ye little hills like lambs. Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. 
David's taunting. He's taunting the powers of the earth. He's taunting the powers of nature. When he says, where was your pain, Red Sea, that you fled away? Psalm 114, 5. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? What was your pain, River Jordan? What was your pain that you ran away from, Eden, from Israel when they approached you? Psalm 114, 5. What ailed thee, thou Jordan? that thou was driven back? Did you tremble, earth, at the presence of God, at the presence of the God of Jacob? Did you tremble so greatly, O earth, that a rock was turned into a source of water? Did you tremble, O earth, so great that a flint became a gushing fountain? This all is what David is doing to encourage himself. This all is what Habakkuk is doing to encourage himself. This is all what we should do to rise over fears. And Habakkuk had fears. Oh, he had fears in verse 16. When he thought and he looked at the Chaldeans and what they were going to do, he was panicked. And he said in verse 16, When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the voice Rottenness entered into my bones. I trembled in myself. What Habakkuk saw made him so afraid. And, 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 and it was at it was the, the time when he, he saw so clearly that Israel was going to land on this time of Psalm 137, 1, Psalm 137, 1, when Israel would be by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they, they that carried us away captive, required of us a song. They that wasted us, required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation of their, uh, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. But like us, Habakkuk resolves to not stay in that depression, to not stay down there, to not stay in that state of despair. And he crawls out. Rebecca crawls out of that pit of panic and terror and depression. And he proclaims in verse 17. He says, Even though, although, the fig tree shall not blossom, there's no fruit on the vines, the labor of the olive tree is going to fail. The fields will yield no meat. The flock will be cut off from the fold. There will be no herd in the stalls. And what the, he, when he's, and he's talking about the invasion of the Chaldeans, the invasion of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Babylonians. And, and he's so afraid, but, but he says this word, although, even though. And this is his recovery. Although he's recovering now from his fright, from his terror, from his trembling, from his bone rottenness and the paralysis of his tongue. It's a huge although, although recovery. This although ex expresses, he's got, Habakkuk is saying, I have a secret source of strength against this news that's weakening me. Uh, this although is that I have an underlying spring of joy against this depression, against this sorrow. I've got a hope against this, this despair that's ravaging me. And he tells us what it is. He tells us what is this all about, this counter. He says, he says when my creature comforts in life, when they're gone, when the fig tree shall not blossom, the fig is seen as giving its sweet fruit, and the blossom is beautiful, it's small, it's delicate, with the colored leaves, it's a sign of hope, hope that the fruit is going to come. But when the fruit tree has no blossoms, hope is gone. And the fig tree with no blossoms is a scene of hopelessness. And he says, neither is there fruit on the vines. The vines are seen as handing to man 
juicy grapes. And they, and they represent, the, the vines represent a lot of work. They don't just do that. They have to be pruned. They have to be trimmed. They have to be tied up for support. All so that they would hand their fruit. And he says, when the vine has no fruit, that's a scene of disappointment and frustration. Disappointment and frustration in life. And then he says, the labor of the olive shall fail. The olive tree is seen as a, as a big tree, one purpose, give the olives, those rich, fat olives, full of oil. And, and, and the olive tree is seen to be working so hard to produce its small little fruit. It's, it's the, 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 the flesh of the olive impregnated with that oil. And he says that he says he's describing that olive tree like an infertile woman, an infertile woman who who lives and she wants with all of her heart to have children. She wants to bear children. She wants to she wants to nourish a child, and yet she's childless. And and it's a scene of purposelessness of life. And he goes on to say, and the fields yield no meat. It's nice to see the fields with their with their with their clover with their with their green rolling, but where's the flocks to eat to change that into meat? And when there's fields with no herds, it's a scene of emptiness, emptiness. And the flocks be cut off from the fold, it's a scene of death. It's a scene of death. So he's got scenes in front of him of hopelessness of disappointment and frustration, of purposelessness, of emptiness, of death. And all these things are, 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 are sapping the very strength out of him. And he can't bear to look at it. And with all those scenes, he says, although, even in spite of, he rises against all the odds. And he, he, and, and he says in verse 18, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And I will do it through the histories. Through the histories in the Bible. You're going to see a man, he's saying, that's going to be jumping up and down because the Red Sea parted. You're going to see a man that's going to walk around with a big smile on his face because the River Jordan split. That's what you're going to see. That's the great yet. That's the great yet. That's the pivot on his heels. That's how he pivots and turns, and he faces all of hopelessness and disappointment and purposelessness and frustration and emptiness and, he de and death, and with a strong defiance right in the face of all of that, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And who is the God of my salvation? His name is Jesus. Jesus. It's also personal. It's also personal. He doesn't say, we will. No. He says, I will. It's his personal stand. And he finishes the book. He finishes his, 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 what he wanted to say in verse 19 by saying, the Lord God is my strength. He'll make me to walk upon mine high places. As for all the powers of hopelessness and disappointment and frustration and emptiness and purposelessness and death, he says, no problem. I have a strength that's not my own. It's God's. And he will strengthen me. And as for my future, he says, he'll make me to walk upon my high places. And just where is that? Heaven. Heaven is my home and I'll walk in heaven. And he says, that's my destiny. He starts with fear, he ends with assurance. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us a blessed assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Stand with me, and we want to close with hymn number 319, Heaven Came Down, 319.
sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down in glory, filled my soul, filled my soul. Born the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justify fully through Calvary's love, oh what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took up the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh praise his dear name. Thank you for your commitment to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you.